Hello, hello, hello. And welcome to tutorial number 29 of our series. Damn, time, time flies by. Uh, where we're going to look into a shortest walk algorithm. Um, and for this one, you will need to download a small plugin, but that shouldn't be a big problem. Uh, we'll do that once once we get to that stage. So to begin with, I will decide what kind of a form I want to do. Um, so let's think about it. Maybe maybe let's just do a vase because that's a vase, vase, a cup, whatever. Uh, because that's always easiest and I want to print this out so it's going to be uh, quite... Uh, quite an easy thing to print as well and might as well be useful because you can add some flowers to it or, or something like that later on. So let's begin. Should we do something in Rhino or should we just straight up jump into Grasshopper? Maybe let's start with Grasshopper. Uh, we'll see. So Vaz, let's say we do an ellipse. Ellipse? like that, which asks us for three inputs. The first one is plane, base plane. So x, y is the default one and that works well for us. And then we have radius one and radius two. So for radius one, I will say, I don't know, I have no idea. So I'll just go for 20. So dash dash or slash slash 20. That will create a panel. Uh, come on. 4K screen on a laptop is not great. Okay, 20. So now the first radius of our ellipse is 20 and the second radius, I don't know, let's try 12 or something like that. Yeah, that seems to be a nice proportion. The reason why I do 12 <clears throat> is because 12 divides by a lot of numbers if I need to do it later on. So we can divide it by four, by three, by two, by six. Uh, so there's a lot of numbers for um, uh, with which we can divide 12 and still get a full number. All right, so now I will take that ellipse, which is the first output of, of this component, and I will move it, move, and I will move it up in Z direction, like that. So I just double click, type in Z, you get unit Z connected to move, uh, move vector like so and then for the factor actually i will not use one number but rather i will use multiple numbers because i want to keep copying it upwards so i'll use series of numbers okay so we have our series let's connect it like so and now we can see what's what's going on right so it's basically making 10 i believe uh, 10 of these curves yeah that's 10 10 of these curves uh, because it's using 10 numbers to, to move it up. <clears throat> so we will start, the starting number should be zero, sure. That means the first curve is right on the XY plane, that's perfect. Uh, the step size, so basically this is the gap, how far each of these curves is away from each other. Let's say the gap is, I don't know, seven, I, I'll, I'll go for seven. Sure, seven seems to you. Is seven fine? Yeah, seven seems to be fine, but this is a little bit, um, a little bit too many of the. Come on, Jesus Christ! This, I'll just create a slider. <laughs> That's gonna be easier. There we go. Seven. The gap between the the, the curves is a bit too much. Um, not not the gap. Sorry, the, the the amount of curves is a bit too much. Or is it? Let's have it set to 10 for now and, and, and we'll see if we need to uh, change it up a bit. I'm not sure about the proportion just yet. Um, okay, and now let's make it a bit fancier. So I will rotate, um, just regular rotate. So I will rotate each one of these um, curves by a different amount. Right, so let's say the first curve is not rotated, the second curve is rotated a little bit, third curve is rotated even more. So what I want to do is I want to have this twist, but I want to have it... 
Hmm. No, I just want every curve to rotate a little bit more and more and more as it goes up. Okay, so first things first, here we have the angle. I will right click on the angle input and I'll choose degrees so that it rotates according to degrees and not radians. And then for this, I will also use series of numbers. And it's very important to use the same uh, count for the movement and the, the, the rotation, like the series of the movement and series of rotation. Because if you have, uh, if you don't have enough numbers for rotation, it's going to start you reusing the numbers from the start of the list. So I will connect it like so. That should, should do the trick. And then we have uh, step size and starting position. Okay, so let's see. Let's first see how it looks like. Yeah, sure, 10 uh, curves, but every one of them is rotated by only one degree. So I want to change that and I will use like, let's go for 30. Um, 30 degrees for, for each curve. So we end up with something like this. If I grab a panel and connect the series to the panel, you can see exactly what's going on. 0, 30, 60, 90, 120, and so on, right? So it keeps on increasing um, the angles for each of these curves. Okay, so we have that, that's easy. And then uh, I will also use scale on them. So I will scale each of these rotated curves and I will scale them around their center point. So for that, I will just get their area centroid. So area centroid like that. Uh, I'm just trying to not have any crossing wires. Um, all right. And by default, each of them are being scaled by 0 0.5. Actually, let me look at the original ones as well. Uh, by default, every one of them are being scaled by 0 0.5. We don't want that. And what I want in this case is I want the bottom and the top one to be, let's say, their, their actual size, but the middle portions of it to increase, to become more bulgy. So I will need to do Let's start with a range of numbers. So I'll need a range of numbers that goes between 0 and 1, and that's the default. So let me grab a panel and show you what it does. So you have two inputs for the range. The first one is domain, and it, by default it says from zero, so from 0 to 1, right? And then it has steps how many steps are there between 0 and 1? And here it says, there's 10 steps, but you can see that what, what this guy gives us is 11 uh, numbers, right? Because it starts counting from zero. And that's bad because if I then connect, um, connect this count slider to the range, you know, it, it doesn't change, but the problem with it is that it's still 11 numbers while we have only 10 curves, right? So that's not good. We need um, range to give us 10 numbers as well. And the way we do it is we just right click on the steps input, we go to expression, and here we write x minus 1. So now it's always going to give us um, the, the, the correct amount of, of numbers. And that's, um, that has something to do with, if I scribble, if you have a line and you cut it into two segments, right, right here, then how many, and the line has a starting point and the end point, how many points will that line have? Well, it will have three points, right? But you cut it in two segments. If you cut a line into four segments, right, that line will have one, two, three, four, five, five points. So it's always plus one, it's always plus one. And the way we mitigate that is by doing minus one uh, here in the expression. Hope that makes at least a bit of sense. Okay, 
But now the problem is, if I connect it, first of all, scale will freak out for, for the bottom one because you're trying to scale it by zero, so it cannot give you a curve. But then it just keeps increasing, right? Um, every curve just keeps increasing in size like that. We don't want that. We want the middle ones to be the biggest ones and the top and the bottom ones to be the smallest ones. So I will use... I can either use a sinus um, sign, this guy right here, or I can use a graph mapper. And I prefer to use a graph mapper in this case. So graph mapper, graph mapper. That's a that's a hard hard word to say. Um, I will right click on it. First of all, I connect the range to the graph mapper. I right click on it. I choose graph types, and I'll find where is the sign. I'll find a sign here, just like that. And then the, uh, the way sign works right here is just half of the bulge. But if I grab the top uh, control point and just move it to the uh, right side, uh, left side, I can kind of find the place for it where it's just going to make this beautiful sign curve. OK, so we have that going. If I now connect it to the factor, you can see that this is what we get. But now there is a problem, right? Um, the bottom and the top curves both are zero uh, in uh, size. Uh, so those are freaking out and I don't want that to happen. I actually want the top and the bottom ones to be one in size and or, or have the scaling factor of one, while the middle one should have the scaling factor of, let's say, 1.5. So it would be 150% bigger. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm just going to use remap numbers, remap numbers. Um, and I will say that, OK, we have three inputs here. First one is value to remap. So that's our, you know, the, the numbers that we get from graph mapper. And I can actually show you them. So those are the numbers that we get. We are going to remap them and we're going to say that the smallest number should be one. And the largest number should be 1.5, right? So, OK, smallest number, um, uh, how, how do we do that? First of all, we, of course, connect graph mapper output to the values input because those are the numbers that we remap. Second, source domain. It's basically, it's asking us uh, to give it the smallest and largest value in this list, right? In this case. So I can do that by using a node that's called bounds. Bounds, like that. And if I check what bounds gives us, it just says, OK, so your, your bounds are between 0 and 0 0.97. That's because, why is that? Just give me the largest number. Ah, whatever. 0 0.97. And I'll just connect it to the source domain, like that. And now I need a target domain. So basically, then I say, what should 0 become? And what should 0 0.97 become, right? So for that, I will create a panel. So I just type in slash slash, or you can just grab a panel from here, doesn't matter. And I will type in uh, 1, spacebar, 2, the word 2, uh, 1.5, like that. 1, 2, 1.5. Don't hit enter. If you hit enter, it's going to make another line. Instead, just click out of, of, the, uh, of the panel. So now if I connect the panel to the target domain value, the, 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 the values that I get are between 1 and 1.5 right here. Super. So now I can use them for sc as scaling factors, just like that. OK, so we have that going on. And then I can just loft. Nothing fancy with that, just loft. So now we have our, our form. It's, you know, whatever. Uh, we can mess around with it. We can, you know, increase or decrease the rotation values. We can uh, make it shorter, make it taller. Uh, that's fine. We can mess around with the sinus. Uh, value here, uh, that's, you know, absolutely up to you. But we have full control over the form of our spiralized um, shape. 
All right, then we have the loft here, uh, which is uh, which, which is super, and now we can go forward with the actual shortest walk, right? What I want to do with this form is I want to make this kind of uh, a root system that goes along the form, uh, this kind of a cool pattern of a root system. So I can do that by, first of all, we need a network of curves covering the whole loft. So I will do that by using, first of all, let's do a bunch of points on it, populate geometry, like that. Populate geometry just places a bunch of points on, on your B reps or your meshes, doesn't matter. Actually, let's keep looking at the loft. And here we have um, three more inputs. We care about two of them. We don't care about the seed input, that's whatever, that just randomizes things. So the first one is count. How many points should it put? And we need a pretty large count. I will say 5,000. Let's try with 5,000. Let's just give it some, some time. Yeah, yeah, sounds about right. Looks about right. And I'll immediately hide the, the, the points because those are way too, like they, they take way too long to render. Um, and then I'll need to work with pre-existing points, but that's a bit later. So, but, but keep that in mind that I will need to use this, this input here. I will need to add more points to this, uh, to this list. Okay, so we have our 5,000 points, and now I want to create a network of curves connecting all of those points, and I can do that by using, I don't remember where it is, I think it's under mesh, triangulation, proximity 3D. Search for three-dimensional proximity within a point list. So the way proximity 3D works is every point checks for its neighbors, so I just connect points to point input here. Every point checks with its neighbors and it finds closest X amount of neighbors. So here under G input, we can see how many neighbors should it find. By default, it's set to five, but I will say three. Because we don't need five. We, we, we don't need that insane amount of points. I hate this screen. I'll just type in three like so, there we go. And then my minimum radius, maximum radius, we don't, we don't care about that. Okay, so there is a problem. And the problem is that we do get a bunch of lines and actually let me flatten out this list. We do get a bunch of lines, like 15,000 lines to be precise. Well, duh, we have 5,000 points and each one of them finds uh, three closest neighbors. Let me hide the loft to show you how it looks like now. Like that. <clears throat> so we have that going on. But, but, um, the problem is that if you have point here, point here, and point here, right? And this is point one, this is point, uh, drawing with mouse is fun, point three. So if this point one says that, okay, point two is my closest neighbor, like that, there's a good chance that once point two starts uh, calculating its neighbors, it's going to say, yo, point one is my closest neighbor. And we end up with having a, we have, uh, end up having double, um, duplicate lines here, right? So we need to remove those duplicate lines. And to do that, I will just use remove duplicate lines tool. I have two of them for some reason. I think that's because I have kangaroo two and kangaroo one installed because those belong to kangaroo. doesn't matter. I just connect them like so. It takes a bit of time, but now instead of 15,000 lines, we end up with 8,800 lines, which is much better. All right, we have that. So now shortest walk. Right, um, you need to download it, uh, download this one. If you go to food for Rhino and you type in shortest walk, shortest walk GH, grasshopper, click on that, just download, 
you know, it's it's going to be a single. Uh, it, it doesn't even have the LL files. It just a sing, It's just a single, a uh, single node. Then you just drag and drop it into your grasshopper, and you're good to go. So shortest walk. You will have this uh, this guy right here. Then, okay. It asks us for curves group. We do have that. I just connect the curves group immediately. So that's our curves group. So it's going to go through this curves group and try and find the closest, uh, like the smoothest path or, or closest, shortest path from one point to another. All right. Then, uh, actually, let's keep looking at it. Then it asks us for lengths. We don't care about that. And I will not cover this in this tutorial. But uh, it, the why it needs uh, it needs to start work to start working it needs you to give it a path right from where do we start searching towards where right to to get that shortest walk so that path is described as a line segment right and that line segment we can do something hmm, what do we do so let's say okay let's say here we have a bunch of curves, right? Um, let me hide that. We have a bunch of curves. And let's say that on the bottom of this curve, how do we do this? Let's say on the bottom of this curve, we have a point, right? So I will just say a point, uh, no. I will say, first of all, give me the first curve. So list item, list item automatically gives me the first point on the uh, first curve on the list, which is the bottom curve. Super. And then for it, I will just say evaluate curve, evaluate curve, and just give me a um, point at zero. Doesn't matter. Okay, sure. A single point, whatever. So we have that. All right. And we need that point to live in, um, to, to be a part of this whole network, right? So this is where we actually need to um, connect it to populate geometry, uh, additional points input, that, that last input here. Just like that. Okay, so we have that going on, and now I need to give it a lot of paths, right? Um, let's look at these points. So I need to give it a bunch of uh, points on this surface, a, a bunch of points from here, so that this curve can uh, find the shortest walk from this point right here to any specified point on this surface. To do that, I will be a bit cheeky, maybe? Yeah, I'll be a bit cheeky and I will say, okay, just randomly reduce, random reduce, randomly reduce this, this large list of points. So I just connect populate geometry to random reduce. Randomly reduce this list of points by a certain amount. And so here we're using 5,000 and I think we can get away. Actually, let's do it this way. I will measure the list length. This is how many points we have, right? List length. And it's going to tell us 5,000. Why does it tell us 5,000 and not 5,001. Ah, we don't care. Whatever. Um, and I will... So we have a number. And I will multiply... Multiplication. I will multiply that number by 0 0.6, let's say. So this is 60% of, of the initial number, right? So we end up with 3,000. Which means that now if I feed in 3000 to this R, that means we are removing 60% of the points, of the original points, and we end up with um, 2000, right? Uh, 2000 points here. 
I think that's gonna work. Yeah. Okay. So now we did that. And now I need to create a crap ton of lines. So we have a lot of points here and we have a single point here and I need to create line, a line segment between the starting point and every point from here. So what we get is this, right? So this is uh, basically <clears throat> our instructions. These lines will work as instructions saying that the shortest path algorithm should, should start searching from this point towards all of these points that are being hit uh, by this line. So then I can just take the, these lines and connect them to short, shortest walk input. Just like that. And I hide it, and this is what we get, right? Quite beautiful. Okay, so we have that going on, but the thing is that most of the time these uh, these curves will take the same, um, th these walks will take the same path to go to, let's say, let's see this point right here, right, and this point right here. So it goes, if we move backwards, right, from this point, it, it moves here, 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 and then continues on to, through this branch, and here it moves back here, 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 and also moves through this branch, meaning that this line, this line, and this line, all three of these lines are duplicates. We don't want that. So again, we will, first of all, the output that we get from here is polylines. So we will explode those polylines like that. So we have a crap ton of segments, which I will right click on the S output and flatten it out so that everything's in a single list. 87,000 curves or lines. Um, and I will use cull not not call uh, remove duplicate lines again remove duplicate lines connect it wait uh, three seconds and now it's done okay so instead of eighty seven thousand we get three thousand eight hundred which is much better right okay so we have that uh, that that working and now it's time to um, actually make this you know, make, make this into a volume that's 3D printable. So I'm going to use a spiralize mode and for that I need a closed volume. So the way we're going to do it is, first of all, let's, let's make these into, in, in, into branches, right? So we could use Dendro or Cocoon plugins, doesn't matter which one we use, both of them are voxel based. Cocoon or Dendro, Cocoon or, well, Dendro is faster, so let's use Dendro for now. Dendro plugin, and here under convert, I will find curve to volume conversion, curve to volume, and just connect my curves to curve input right here. And then for radius, uh, radius, uh, let, let's think. For now, let's just have radius set to one and we'll figure it out later. <laughs> so radius is one. And then settings is, um, yeah, that's also a dendro input, right? Yeah, create settings right here. From dendro, create settings. And here in the settings, I believe all we need is just the size. Well, yeah, just the voxel size. So I will specify that the uh, voxel size needs to always be smaller than the curve radius. So I'll go for 0 0.5. Just like that. Okay, there we have it. So so it's it's uh, creating a, a volume. The, the, the curves are a bit too thick. Uh, for, for my taste for sure, but there is one thing that I want to do and that thing is If not if but when the curves are moving up The higher the curve is the thinner 
sorry, uh, the, the higher the curve is, the thinner it should become. How do we do that? Um, well, first of all, sorry, I'm blabbing a bit, but I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking, should we have a bottom, bottom ring here? Maybe not. Well, for now, let's, let's not have a bottom ring here. Okay, so how, how do we measure how high the curve is? Well, we need a point on the curve. So we, we do have a bunch of lines here and I can just say evaluate length, evaluate length of these curves at 0 0.5. Meaning I always get a middle point for, for each of these line segments, just like that. And then I want to know how high are they in Z axis, right? So I will deconstruct, deconstruct those points, point deconstruct, or I think it's just called deconstruct. Yeah, it's just called deconstruct. I will deconstruct those points and I get their Z coordinate. And I will just remap them to radii that I want, right? So we, we have Z coordinates, which go from, you know, almost zero to something high up, like 35. So let me use remap numbers, just like we did with the scaling. And I will be remapping the Z uh, height and source domain. Again, we use bounds to know which point is the lowest and which one is the highest. And if I grab a panel, I can show you. So this is the lowest point and this is the highest. So the highest point is 60, almost 63 millimeters above our, C, our XY plane. And then my target is going to be, let's say in the bottom, the thickness of them I like, so I'll say one, but in the top, I want a smaller thickness. So I will say one to 0 0.5, like half of the thickness, just like that. One to 0 0.5. So now every curve, every line that we have gets a number attached to it, right? And I can connect those numbers as my radii here. And why is this freaking out? Wait, let me let me group this. And it's freaking out. Just half of it is freaking out. Why are you freaking out? Oh, uh, radius must be at least 33% larger than voxel size, right? So our smallest radius is 0 0.5 and our voxel size is 0 0.5. That doesn't work. We need our voxel size to be smaller. So I'll do 0 0.2, something like that. Yeah, there we go. Now, now, now it works. Uh, so we end up with something like this, which is not too bad. Yeah, we can, we can work with this. It has a nice pattern to it. Okay. So I guess we can smooth it out, right? A, a little bit because it's, it's a little bit blocky in certain places. So I'll just use, um, where is it? Filters, smooth volume, right here. Just connected like so. You can control the how, how smooth it is by changing the width, but I will keep it as it is. So now it's smoothed out a little bit. Okay, we have that going on. And now uh, I can't. Well, technically I can print this, but it's not going to be a easy print to do. It would be a torture test for my printer. And I actually want it to be at least semi watertight. So I want to um, make this into this kind of a brick into this block. And then I can use vase mode or spiralize outer contours mode if you're in Cura to just print out the outer perimeter of the form. So from here, yeah, we have this volume. I will also grab my loft, which is here, and I will cap the top and the bottom of my loft to get a closed B-rep. 
I'll drag it all the way to the end of my definition right here. And for this cap, I will go to convert and I'll just choose mesh to volume, right? Like that. And for settings, I will use the same uh, volume settings as I used for uh, for for the other uh, for for the curves. Okay, so I have this volume here as well. Let me place it like so. Okay, we have one volume. We have another one. We need to merge them. And these are actually dendro volumes. These are not meshes or anything like that. So we need to use dendro tools. And the one, the one that we want is under intersect volume union. There we go. And holding down the shift key, I'll just connect both of them in. And it gives me one big happy volume right here, which is kind of cool. And do we smooth it? I will smooth it. I will, sm uh, I will smooth the volume again, so I'll just copy the volume smooth tool and uh, connect it again. So it's, it's like uh, dub double smoothing. I just want it to be as, as kind of clean as possible. Okay, and I will not be increasing the, the, the intensity. You can increase it here, but I, I still want to, to, to keep the details, right? So, so let's, let's have it as it is. And now this volume needs to be converted to a mesh for this to work. So I'll go to convert volume to mesh right here, like that. And it also asks me for settings, I believe, global volume settings to be used. So these are the settings that I'm using, right? So I just connect these settings to this and put here. <clears throat> and I end up with a mesh. And just in, in case I will use uh, combine and clean because sometimes it gives me an invalid mesh. If it gives you an invalid mesh, uh, all you need to do is just kind of mess around with the, uh, with the point amount or reduce points here or the form, doesn't matter. If you mess just slightly mess around with the sliders, it's going to give you a, a decent clean mesh. Okay, so we have that done. And now let me bake it out right here. Let's look at it. Uh, minimize that. Shade it. Zoom selected. So that's how it looks like. Pretty, pretty good. Yeah, can't complain. Uh, pretty nice. And I will go to Arctic view just to double check. Yeah, that's a nice pattern. I enjoy that pattern. We uh, we could uh, do less, of course. Uh, you know, we could do less uh, less points. We could have everything smoother. Blah blah blah. But as a as a test or proof of concept, I think this is this is good. So now, and this is a if I type in what clothed closed double precision polygon mesh, meaning I can export it as an STL file, I can put it in Cura, I can 3D print it and, uh, you know, just have a vase that has this pattern. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm doing this with uh, vases and spaceships and shit like that, but you don't need to, you know, all of this can be applied to architecture as well. Um, I, I believe Kokugia project by Roland uh, Snooks uh, did it first, like five years ago or even more now, maybe maybe seven years ago. Um, but yeah, just just mess around with this and uh, hope you uh, hope you learn something new. Um, actually, I will print this out. So give me a second, and or actually give me like I, I assume like four hours and I will show you how it looks like. So I'll see you then. And 
here it is. It's a little bit messy, a little bit all over the place, and you can see right here there are some strings. Uh, so there are a few a few ways of how I could optimize this uh, process, but other than that, I'm pretty happy with with the result. I can definitely use this as a as a bucket of some sorts. You know, oh, something like that. Just just to hold my tools, I'll probably do that. And uh, there was one thing though that I noticed, and it's Cura Slicer uh, really doesn't like spiralized uh, contours uh, to do spiralized contours with um, intense heavy meshes that have a lot of vertices. So if you're planning on doing this in vast mode. As, as I did here, I would suggest that you look into... <laughs> yep. Uh, I suggest that you look into uh, Prusa Slicer rather than Cura, because Prusa Slicer seems to do less mistakes. Uh, other than that, this turned out quite well. I'm pretty happy with it. So, all of the files are available for my Patreons. Um, link in the video description. Um, of course, you can just follow the tutorial and have a, you know, have a script done by yourself. That's fine as well. This is just for lazy people that want to support the channel. And hope you, all of you, I may, maybe I should have this in the, some, somewhere here. Hope all of you enjoyed this um, tutorial and I will see you in a few days with a new one. Bye.